So I just want to welcome everyone to Coffee and Connections, how DFW is hitting a hole in one. My name is Carla Rosenberg, and I serve as president of DICE. In my regular day job, I serve as senior vice president of charity and events management for Sport5. And we're just excited to have you all join us this Friday morning for our third installment this year of Coffee and Connections. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with DICE, as we've had a lot of non-members join us for these virtual discussions, um, we connect and develop the rising generation of industry leaders to fuel bold social change. And so our members are Dallas-Fort Worth area professionals who are employed by or connected to sports and entertainment organizations. We host multiple events a year for our members that focus on the goal of providing professional development, networking, and charitable opportunities. So at DICE, we also proudly support local nonprofits through our grants that we give at our annual Fast Pitch event each year. And we have distributed over $700,000 to area nonprofits since 2013. So how do we do this? We create programming that shines a light on all the people and programs and, and platforms that makes DFW unique to our industry while providing members meaningful connection and development opportunities. So in today's new world, these opportunities have most entirely moved online. And to that end, I would like to thank our events committee led by Paige Scott of Sport5, Todd Krumholtz with JTK Talent, Amanda Lada with Tony Fay PR, and Catherine Buckley with the Sports Institute, Sports Leadership Institute, I apologize, for putting these virtual series together for us to offer meaningful content and connection. So I encourage all of you that have just uh, joined us to tune in and that have tuned in to please feel free to share your name and business information in the chat if you wish to network. We'll give a shout out to one of our featured panelists today. The format of our program this morning will be a 25 minute moderated discussion followed by 15 minutes in a breakout room where you may get some Q&A time with one of the featured guests today. And then there will be a DICE board member in each breakout room that will lead and close out that session for you. So now it's time to tee this discussion up and talk about the business of golf. You see what I did there? So the month of May is all about golf in DFW. We're home to the PGA Tours AT&T Byron Nelson, who has a new home this year, and the Charles Schwab Challenge. And speaking of new homes, PGA of America is in the midst of moving its world headquarters to Frisco dubbing the city the future Silicon Valley of golf. And we are extremely fortunate to have market president and publisher, Dallas Business Journal, Ali Chandhawk, moderate this exciting program this morning. So thank you for being here today and giving your time and talent. And we'd also like to welcome our three featured panelists, Chief Membership Officer of PGA of America, John Easterbrook, Tournament Director of AT&T Byron Nelson, John Drago, Tournament Director from Charles Schwab Challenge, Michael Toth. And on behalf of DICE, we are delighted to have coffee with one of you this morning and appreciate your, you sharing your time and insights with us. So as you can tell, this is an above par lineup and I won't waste any more time. I'm gonna hand this over to Ali to get this conversation started. Thanks, Carla. Um, I think you meant under par lineup, right? That's, that's, that's the good side. Uh, <laughs> folks, I'm, I'm Ollie Chandock. I'm the president, the market president and publisher for the Dallas Business Journal. I, I'm assuming all of you are familiar with DBJ. We are, uh, if you're not, we're a multimedia, multi-platform media company. We, we um, serve to inform, but also to create connections in the business community. Uh, we cover everything. We're hyper-local. Uh, no industry is uh, exempt from us. We'll cover almost anything, including the sports business world. And so, so very exciting stuff happening at DBJ. Uh, if you haven't attended one of our events, you've probably heard about the 40 Under 40 Awards, the Women in Business Awards, all of those types of things. Uh, it seems a lot of what we're writing about in recent, uh, in recent months and even years is corporate reload to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I think we all know that uh, um, the PGA of America is headed this way, and that was one of the biggest stories over the last couple of years. So very excited to be here. Thank you, Carla and team, for, uh, for including me in this. Um, my background, just to give you a little bit of, of background, I, I actually started with the business journals 13 years ago from the, um, really from the ground up, I started by selling subscriptions in Charlotte in 2008. 
Uh, that was uh, kind of a challenging time as well, or as, as the last, similar to the last year, it was a little bit crazy. Uh, and worked in Charlotte for six years and then spent a year at the corporate office for the business journals and traveled um, nationwide and worked with all of the publishers, mainly on recruiting and hiring. And then I was promoted into the role of publisher uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so I spent four years in, in little town Greensboro. Um, I wouldn't say that if I was there, uh, but it is kind of the little brother for Charlotte and Raleigh and it sits right in the middle of Charlotte and Raleigh. Um, John, who you'll meet in a second, and, and Michael actually know my buddy, Mark Brazel, very well. Brazel is the tournament director at the Wyndham Championship in Greensboro, and he's become a, a really good friend. So i um, really, really excited to be here. I'm going to bring up um, our panelists. Uh, actually, one of the other things that Carla wanted me to mention, I try not to mention this too often. Um, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, um, and I moved south to Charlotte uh, on a golf scholarship. So, so I played competitive golf for a, for a while. Um, I thought one day that I would uh, pursue a career, a competitive career, but the problem was I actually suck at golf. Uh, so, so after a year or so of trying to pursue it, I realized that this wasn't for me. Uh, and 20 years later, I'm a country club guy that's just trying to, trying to break 85. So um, that's my connection to golf. And uh, I'm a big fan to say the least. So here we are. Let me bring them up. John, John, and Michael, who Carla or, or Carla just introduced. Guys, you want to say hello? Good morning. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Hi. Ollie. Thanks. Uh, I can't wait to hear Michael's response about you being from Toronto. And then I can't <laughs> wait to call Brazel and tell him he always finds his way into any tournament discussion. <laughs> and he has a friend. <laughs> yeah, good point. I might be his only friend, and he's definitely not shy, but Brazel is, uh, he's, he's thrilled. He's supposedly he's going to come visit us at some point, so we'll see if that actually actually transpires. So, folks, we're going to jump right in uh, to John Drago. Uh, John, obviously, the, uh, the Byron Nelson did not happen last year. Um, you know, here's our opportunity. This is the first year at TPC Craig Ranch up here in Collin County. Talk to us about kind of the, the planning of the, of the tournament behind the scenes and how, the, how it all led up to this week, next week. Yeah, thanks, Ali. It's been it's been a fascinating run for sure. You know, most of the people on here probably know that we had decided to find a new home for the AT and T Byron Nelson, and we had made that announcement kind of right before all of this happened. And I would start by saying, you know, right now it's just really refreshing to be working on a golf tournament. Uh, you know, having been canceled um, in 2020, you know, one of the things in our jobs we 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 deal daily with changes and flexibility you know we run an outdoor sport so we plan for contingencies all the time but you know the unwinding of a tournament that never happened due to a global pandemic is just something that you never really can prepare for so you know the idea of 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 being three days away from opening the gates right now is really refreshing for us to be working on it's been 726 days since we gave the trophy to uh, our last champion sun kang uh, so we couldn't be more excited. Uh, it's been it's been a crazy run. You know, the idea of coming to a new community, new corporate partners, new golf course, uh, new membership um, and building those relationships while also developing the operational planning, uh, selling products and all that kind of all at the exact same time. You know, we we've really been overwhelmed by the support that we received from the community here. Uh, the outreach that they've had has been just unbelievable for us when you you kind of think about the fact that we were operational planning, we were selling products and we really, people were buying things before it was even fully developed. You know, we were writing things down on a napkin. We didn't have a, a product brochure because we had just made the announcement and we were putting it all together at the same time. So it's been quite the, quite the process. Luckily it's all, it's all worked out. Um, you know, we, we always say that we planned three tournaments at the same time. Uh, throughout the summer and the fall, we planned for one with no fans. We planned for one with limited fans. And we planned for one with, you know, we all thought this thing was going to be long over by now. So we'd, we'd have a, a full set of fans. So we finished right there in the middle. Uh, we PJ Tour approved our, our plan for 12,500 fans uh, starting next week. And uh, we're just really kind of have a, a sense of gratefulness right now that we're, that we're ready to go. John, I think that's that's terrific. Uh, I, I live right across the street from Craig Ranch, so I'm very excited to just have to walk uh, to the tournament because I know what happens at, as a fan at the tournament. It can get uh, it can get pretty entertaining. Uh, so, so I'm going to switch this over to Michael. Uh, Michael, Charles Charles Schwab Challenge. You guys did have a tournament last year. 
Uh, talk to me about what we can expect this year. What key plans are you putting into place? Are there any changes that we can look forward to in, uh, in 2021? Yeah, thanks, Ollie. Um, 17 days to be precise away from uh, our event in Fort Worth. You know, we're celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. We're the longest running event on the PGA Tour at the same venue. So I think that's a testament to, you know, the membership here at Colonial, the city of Fort Worth, North Texas, and, and, and the fans of golf. It's a little bit of Groundhog Day for us to a certain degree. We, we had the fortunate or opportunity to, to bring golf back to the fans last year. Our date got moved from, from May to June. And uh, what John's going through now, we went through last year, three or four plans and then a fifth and maybe a sixth and back to the second and over to the fourth. And what, what we hoped uh, was that this time last year, we would be like full build and welcoming, you know, 100% of our, our fans back. We, we learned quickly in August, September that we had a, a, a smattering of answers. Hey, can you entertain? Can you not entertain? We're still working from home. We've got a deposit with you. We, I know we have an agreement. Can we get out of it? So we met with all of our partners and we made the decision really in October, November to sell tickets only. We just felt like we couldn't make the risk of building something in a corporate partner, and not be able to, to keep to that commitment because of COVID. And so we, we shifted, we pivoted, we, we are selling Colonial unlike we've ever sold before. And we have three ticket options and they're daily tickets and it includes food and beverage. So if you have a clubhouse ticket or one of our 75th anniversary tickets that gets you access to our villages or our premium grounds, it all comes with food and beverage, beer, wine, anything on, in one of our 14 concession locations. Obviously a higher price point than your $50 grounds ticket. So it's a 575, a 475 and a 175 respectively. And, and the community has responded well. It's, it's a little bit of sticker shock, but the amenity package is good. Again, it was one of those things where we just, you know, we wanted to have uh, 80 private venues. We wanted to have sort of our Champions Club and our grill and, and all those fan amenities. But after talking with the community partners that have supported our event for a long time, we were sort of forced down this road. And, and it's okay. I think it's kind of a throwback to golf 75 years ago. Very little build, unlike John. Um, so it's kind of neat to see what John's doing in McKinney and what we're doing here. And, and hopefully for us, we'll get somewhere to back to normal, but it's, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride. It's been a, an unbelievable for all of us on this call. The last 24 months has really been uh, an eye opener and it's caused us to look at our business model a little bit different and it's forced some disruption and it's forced us to make some hard decisions, but, but we feel good about it. We, we like our field. We like that we've got 17 more days to sell a few more tickets, but it, it's, it's going well. Hey, Michael and, and John, just real quick before we move on, I'm curious to know, you, you touched on this a little bit, Michael, you, you know, because of COVID and because of all the restrictions we've had, you've had to make some concessions and adjustments to your, your uh, benefits that you can offer partners and sponsors, right? What, what, what did that look like? Like how, how many changes and what were the changes that you had to make for your partners? I'll go first. Oh, yeah. You know, it, um, you know, trades are a big part of what, what we've done. Um, player amenities is, is a big part. Volunteer amenities, you know, and, and I understand it that, you know, the tour is, is really enforcing John and I to, to work on a program to, 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 you know, enforce certain things. Right. And, and we're here in Texas, uh, Fort Worth, McKinney, North Texas. So I feel like we will probably not be planning or not executing what we're execu what we're talking about today for John next week in our event. But, but back to your original question, we've changed everything. I mean, we've never offered tickets before with food and beverage included at every level. We, you know, we've never done grab and go for our volunteers. Um, you know, player tickets, Ryan Palmer, Jordan Spieth, JJ Henry, you know, your DFW guys that have a lot of friends and family, we would be accommodating with tickets for them. Now it's two a day. So 
Ollie, we've looked at everything and we've had to make, like I said earlier, we've had to make some, some, some tough business decisions, but it's, it's going to make us better in the long run. Yeah, I would agree. We went down a similar path, although we, we came to a, a different decision early on. He, he alluded to, you know, we do have a, what we call a full build for our hospitality customers. And part of that is what I was referring to earlier of the amount of support that we had and the number of people who purchased early on. And quite frankly, they, they also committed to the full five years of our agreement here at um, TPC Craig Ranch. Uh, so we wanted to do everything we could to make sure that they got full value. And quite frankly, we got full revenue from those um, customers as well. So instead of, instead of uh, kind of scaling back the build, we kind of operated under the fact that we might be at 50% capacity um, inside our venues. Um, which would be about 36 square feet per person. So, and we didn't want to take tickets back. We wanted to provide full value. So we actually built overflow areas for each of those hospitality units. So if the customers were going to have to manage their tickets, they could have 50% inside their venue and then 50% that could go into overflow venues. Uh, we were lucky uh, while we're still limited in total capacity at 12,500, we were allowed to go to hundred percent occupancy inside our suites um, just last week. So what that enabled us to do is the limited grounds tickets that are out there, uh, we're able to give those overflow decks and viewing spaces to the general public that's gonna be out there watching as well. So a little bit different uh, attack. And then similarly, you know, grounds tickets or any day tickets that used to come with packages, we just can't do anymore. Used to buy a Pro-Am, you'd get 10 any day tickets to the tournament. Um, you know, you have to know what day everybody is showing up so that you can keep track of the numbers. So those, those sorts of things don't happen anymore. Guys, I think that's, that's super impressive. I, I look forward to seeing it. It, it. It's, it's crazy how much all businesses have had to navigate, including, uh, including PGA tournaments. Uh, I'm going to shift to John Easterbrook. John, the, the PGA of America is relocating the headquarters to, to Frisco area, DFW area. Omni just had the groundbreaking earlier this week. Talk to us about the PGA in Frisco and what we can expect. Yeah, I, um, thank you, first of all, for including me this morning. And, and the you know, John and Michael have both said the community support um, has been amazing. Um, the state support, you know, we had the, the governor at the groundbreaking, um, obviously uh, city officials. Um, we, uh, we are well into it. Um, as uh, mentioned in the opening, we're moving our headquarters here. It's going to coin the modern home of golf or the Silicon Valley of golf, certainly um, we've, we've got uh, the cornerstone of, uh, of the development is bringing our headquarters here. Um, our headquarters, uh, we have 57 people in market now. We'll end up having, you know, well in, you know, well over 250 at some point. Uh, that sits at the property, eight, two 18 hole golf courses, one built by Gil Hands, one built by Bo Willing, a 10 hole lighted golf, uh, lighted short course, which, uh, one of the cool things, you know, in in collaboration with Gil and Bo is you'll be able to putt uh, from tee to green. So one of the cool things about PGA Frisco is we feel like we will be able to uh, take a junior player or the, the time a person has uh, or a young uh, uh, young kid has a club in their hand for the first time all the way to the PGA Tour. Uh, and that's pretty special. North Texas PGA will have their home there. We'll have some some retail. Uh, our education actually uh, will will teach ball flight out of the bottom bottom of our education building. There's a 30 acre range. If you can think about that, it's I, I've told people that you could probably almost um, uh, hit it in a round, but we we're kind of in a horseshoe. Um, so you'll have the North Texas PGA anchoring one one area of that. Our education anchoring another. The teaching and coaching center, and then normal play. And then obviously um, a couple of the cool factor, cool things are we have a 75,000 acre putting green. So that's two acres. Um, the world, I think we, we were joking. We were looking at the world's longest putt in Guinness Book of World Records and it was 137 yards. So we're hoping that maybe uh, Wednesday or Thursday nights, we can, we can try to break that record uh, there and have some fun with some music going. Um, we've got a lot of interactive stuff going between the resort and the golf facility. Um, you know, uh, Disneyland on, you know, Disneyland for golf, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be inviting. It's going to be open to all. Um, 
and again, just the, you know, the rolling family, uh, the Omni resorts with their groundbreaking 505 room resort, seven cottages, it's all golf. It's golf centric. Um, it's going to be, you know, I've been fortunate. I've been in this industry 36 years and, um, I've, I've traveled the world, frankly. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, one of the top, you know, three to five destinations in the world. So, you know, the love, the passion, the commitment. And I, I think the his, you know, as, as John and Michael said, the historical nature of, of, of Dallas and, and, um, the Metroplex and, and Fort Worth and the state of Texas with all the, the love of the game, you know, the momentum is absolutely crazy. So, uh, our headquarters will open the first quarter of next year. Uh, we are slated. The golf courses are grassed, um, which uh, we're finishing the grassing of the short courses uh, right now. Uh, but the actual 36 holes of championship golf um, are grassed. And we are we probably could play this fall, but we are going to grow it in. Uh, it's very important for us to hit the ground running, obviously, because, um, you know, we need uh, to be perfect in the spring of 23 and we will start uh we will host the first of 26 televised championships that we are bringing to the city of frisco um in uh, may of 2023 so golf course is slated to open august of 2022 um and everything else primarily will open uh, spring of 23 hey, hey john the uh gil hans built the uh olympic golf course in brazil a couple of years ago right yes so we can expect a pretty impressive golf course. Um, I, so, yeah, I think it will be one of the best in the world. Awesome. That's awesome. So, John, just real quick, I'm curious to know, you've touched on this a little bit, the economic impact of those tournaments that are slated to come to the PGA um, area there. What uh, Can you talk to that, us about that? I mean, we're talking major championships and potentially a Ryder Cup, right? Yes, we are. Um, 26 televised championships. Um there are some uh, performance metrics that we have to look at as it relates to the first PGA championship uh, is in 27. Um, and there's some performance metrics to deliver a Ryder Cup, but the golf courses and the facilities were built to host, uh, you know, the largest of all events. Uh, the mayor stated that, um, and I'll just use that quote because I don't have anything else, $2.5 billion of economic impact that that facility will bring to, uh, to, the, uh, to the area. So, a lot of jobs, um, you know, there'll be a, over a thousand jobs coming in, you know, between uh, the golf course and the, and the hotel. Um, and then if you think about what will be going on around, you know, the, the golf course community um, to the south, to the north and to the east, um, it, it's all going to, to just explode and, and um, uh, restaurants, um, many, many places, uh, residential um mixed use, all of that stuff. So there's some exciting things that are uh, that are planned around the community. And this has just propelled all of that um, on, a, on a much uh, faster timeline. Thanks, John. So I'm going to go back to John Drago. Um, John, next week, Byron Nelson, I, I follow social media for you guys and all the, the anything golf related pretty much. I'm seeing all the commitments from players. Talk to me about the, the, the Texas representation here with your field. I mean, it's an exciting field. It's tremendous. Yeah, thanks. We uh, we are definitely excited about next week. Um, man, listening to John Eastbrook, I will say, what other market could support three events like this? You think in 27, if the schedule stays the same, PJ Tour will run through McKinney, Frisco, and Fort Worth in three straight weeks. That'll be pretty exciting. Um, no, we we couldn't be more excited. You know, the, the the players in North Texas have always supported both our event and Michael's at Charles Schwab. They couldn't be better. They help us not only during tournament week by plan, but they help us year round in the community. They support our charities. They just have always been really supportive. And, it, and it's really indicative in my opinion to what is really great about the sport that we, that we all participate in. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, you know, Jordan Spieth, Ryan Palmer, Scotty Scheffler, the, you know, Will Zalatoris with what he's doing right now uh, has been just so supportive of us. Bryson, and interestingly enough, uh, Sun Kang, our defending champion from 2019, is also you know lives right here, and he's actually going to be defending here on his home golf course at TPC Craig Ranch. So that'll be fun to watch. Um, and then also we've we've learned that since we since the schedule kind of flipped and the PGA Championship moved to May, and we ended up being the week before the PGA, 
it, uh, it's really kind of changed the dynamic of our field. You know, there's a lot of people that like to play the week before and some that don't. So we kind of lose a few and gain a few. And, and uh, you know, we've had several players that have been pretty supportive of us. It's, it's changed to a little bit more of an international flavor for us. Uh, players that we wouldn't have typically gotten like Lee Westwood and Thomas Peters and uh, Antoine Rosner, you know, those sorts of players that are playing in the PGA championship the week after. So we're really excited. We're ready to roll. Uh, they'll start arriving here on uh, Monday. Awesome, John. I'm going to shift over to Michael again. Michael, talk to me about, you know, one of the, I think the PGA Tour, I don't know the exact numbers around this, but the PGA Tour is one of the biggest uh, contributors to nonprofits and charities locally. Talk to me about the community impact of the, of the Charles Schwab. Yeah, you know, before the Dell Match Play event, um, you know, Houston at the time, uh, Shell Houston Open, now the Houston Open, Valero Texas Open, um, the Salesmanship Club of Dallas, and us, we, we represented 25% of all charity dollars generated on the PGA Tour. And I mean, I think that just speaks to what Texas is and, and to John's point and John's point, um, what an amazing community we have. And to, you know, we, we're a little different. You know, we're owned and operated and managed by Colonial Country Club. So, you know, as our business changed and shifted back in the early 2000s, we created a program which was called the Birdies for Charity program. And in essence, it started with a few local uh, 501c3s here in, in Tarrant County. And they went out and they sought out pledges based on birdies or eagles or, or whatever the case may be. Well, you fast forward and, and I think we helped generate about $175,000 back in 2005. You fast forward to you know, an unbelievable stat in 2020, we now have 33 birdies for charity, charity programs. And that's everything from the first tee of Fort Worth to the warm plays to YMCA to, uh, you know, Fort Worth Youth Orchestra. And we helped generate about $14 million. And again, those charities, those 33 charities, they do the yeoman's work. They go out, they seek pledges, they have events, they have capital campaigns. And what we tried to do here with our event is we have a match fund of about a half a million dollars. And those 33 charities, if they reach certain plateaus from a charitable generation number, we help match that. And I think it's just, again, it speaks to the partnerships with the charities we have. It speaks to the community support and using the platform of our golf tournament, it, it makes it really it's almost like you go, you know, we go to our annual tour event and they're like, how do you generate $14 million for charity? And it's like, well, it's not all us. It's our charities that do the hard work, but we're just happy to be a part of it and use the golf term as a platform. And, and for John Drago, um, the, the, the AT&T Byron Nelson's longtime supporter of, or partner with the Salesmanship Club and then supporting the Momentus Institute. Talk, talk to us about how that is structured and how that works. Yeah, you bet. Uh, you know, everybody's got the the why of what they're why they do what they do, and for us, you know, that is the Momentous Institute. You know, the the Salesmanship Club has been helping children and families in Dallas for over a hundred years in our community, and they've found various different ways to raise money for that effort, and uh, they do so through education and mental health services. And it was back in 1968 where they decided they wanted to reach out with Mr. Nelson and see if he wanted to partner with them to. To, uh, to operate this new PGA Tour event that was coming to Dallas. Um, and since then, 50, this will be our 53rd tournament um, with Byron Nelson's name on it. And we've helped raise $167 million during that time to help children and families. And, and quite frankly, you know, we're the only tournament on the PGA Tour. Michael mentioned we're a little bit different than uh, some other tournaments. We're the only tournament that the host organization, the Salesmanship Club, owns and operates both the tournament that it runs and the charitable beneficiary that benefits from it. Um, so it's emotional for us, it's personal for us, and uh, it's important for us for sure. Uh, John Easterbrook, I think you touched on this a little bit, but um, some of the some of the similar question, what, what are the plans for community impact and supporting charitable nonprofits and those organizations with the PGA? Yeah. Yeah, Ali, that's, um, you know, and again, hats off to John and Michael. I mean, it just the, the, the numbers that the, those two events are, are, um, are producing are amazing, but, uh, the PGA is, is, uh, you know, our, our program's called PGA reach, which has four pillars. Now, and the four pillars are, um, our hope program, which is help our patriots everywhere, which is military. 
our junior league golf, which has exploded. Um, that's our youth program. Uh, PGA Works, which is one that I'm um, incredibly excited about, which is um, bringing inclusion and diversity into the game. Um, we just finished up our PGA Works Collegiate Championship at TPC Sawgrass um, with our great partners at the tour. Just finished. Uh, I just got back to Frisco um, Tuesday from, from that event. And uh, just amazing. We're, we're um, expanding that to include a career expo. Um, and then a, a, what we call a place to play which is our newest pillar and that will be um, accessible golf. And, and we're piloting that program in Florida right now. Um, but all four of those programs um, will have a huge uh, presence at PGA Frisco. Um, it will be the home of all of those championships that I just mentioned. Um, and I think one of the really cool things about this project is the PGA of America has never had their home, you know, sitting on a site. Um, so we can bring the public into who PGA professionals are, 28,000 men and women out there, 19,000 of them working at 15,000 facilities. You know, they're different than the PGA Tour players that everybody sees on the weekend and, and on, on television. Um, these are the men and women that are, you know, in the trenches making it happen. Um, and those programs are going to be robust. Um, and then they will be showcased each and every year as we bring their championships back to PGA Frisco. So, John, I'm going to stay with you here. Last question I had, and then we'll move to the uh, to the breakout rooms. My wife asked me this actually two days ago. Can you can you tell us the difference or the separation between the PGA Tour and the PGA of America? <laughs> yeah, it's confusing. It is. Um, and if you really, you know, I, I, this this could be a long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. You know, we we were the same organization until 1961. And then we split apart. Um, the easiest way to explain it, frankly, I had to explain it to my kids. So, um, you know, the PGA, the PGA Tour are um, the or are the men, the, the men we see on uh, the the weekends that can really play. I mean, it's they can really play. I mean, the old commercial. These guys are good. They're they're really good, and we have some great players in the PGA of America as well. I mean, we have twenty PGA professionals playing in the PGA Championship. That's pretty cool. Um, but they are, uh, our uh, association is the, as mentioned, the 28,000 men and women that are working at the facilities, um, de delivering golf on a daily basis, growing the game, um, and, and um, out there giving lessons, you know, opening the shops, uh, driving revenue, driving programming, administering the junior league golf programs, um, and being the, you know, the ambassadors for the game. Um, you know, as I said, some of them still play and play very well at a very high level, but, but that's primarily the difference in that the PGA Tour players are the ones that you'll see um, on the television on the weekend. John, that was a, that was a great answer. I know that that question's kind of funky. Um, for, the, for the three of you, anything we missed, anything that golf fans should look out for in the next, uh, um, well, next week, but then also in the next couple of years? I have one thing. And I think it's really cool. Just just be um, be on the lookout for a, a new, um, I would say, industry wide initiative um, campaign called "Make Golf Your Thing," and uh, it's going to be really cool. It's going to bring in all aspects of the game, whatever that means to anybody. Um, you know, we're we're trying to to uh, capitalize on the uh, the bubble effect that we had you know, during COVID. You know, we were very fortunate as an industry with back to golf uh, to be able to stay open and, and uh, we didn't face um, the issues of other countries. Um, we got ahead of the, of the things and, you know, we need to capitalize on that. The game needs to be more inclusive, more diverse, and we're focused on that. And uh, again, just look, look out for that and, and make golf your thing. That's, that's all I can say. So uh, the 50 people on the call, make golf your thing. I would, I would agree with him hundred uh, percent. It is my thing, John, for sure. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, I think how we, you know, we, we convert all these people that are new to golf right now. It's hard to find a tee time anywhere for sure right now and how we, we keep them playing and how we get them watching golf and how we get them consuming our sport. Um, you know, I think nothing represents what's good in this world right now more than, than those people that play golf and those that give back and those, that sort of thing. So I just want to say thanks, Ollie, for doing this today. Thanks, Dice, for uh, putting this together and 
all that you do for our industry and what you've done for the North Texas Food Bank during all this. It's just been really great. We really appreciate being here. Awesome, John. I appreciate it. Michael, any final thoughts before we go to breakout rooms? Oh, I mean, I just, uh, I think it's, it's really a testament to everybody on this call having some interest in golf. You know, John touched on, I mean, tee times are up 35% here at Colonial. Um, it's just, it, again, it's forcing, you know, we're looking at Gil Hands to, to do a, a redesign here in 2022. Give, uh, board just approved it. It's going to go to the membership. So, you know, when you're talking about those strategic opportunities in a pandemic and, I mean, golf, the ratings of golf are up. So it's a, it's a, it's a good time for golf. And, um, you know, hats off to, to the PJ of America and in trusting Texas. We love that they're coming here. Uh, best wishes to John Drago next week. He's got a stellar field. It's going to be amazing to watch on TV. He's going to have a great champion. And uh, I appreciate everybody being on the, uh, the, the coffee session this morning. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. I thought those, the, the conversation was terrific. John, John, Michael, I appreciate the, the time spent with us. We're going to be moved into breakout rooms briefly here. We've got a few minutes left and uh, a good opportunity for folks to ask you questions directly. So let's, uh, let's jump into the rooms.